Yay. Uh, so I'm from the American Red Cross. Uh, I work in international services. I know uh, quite a few of you here, which is awesome. Good to see some other fellow humanitarians here. Um, and just all the, all the great work um, going on uh, today. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about um, how we teach GIS to some of our partner national societies. Um, because I'm sure we've all at some point in our careers received this question. Um, hey, can you teach me GIS? Um, and, and that question comes in a wide variety of forms. Um, you know, it's just adding layers, right? Um, or can you just do a, a brown bag session over lunch and, and, and fill us in? Um, or a quick, uh, hey, that, that's really cool what you're doing. Um, can, can you do a quick workshop and teach everybody that? And so, and so naturally that comes with a little bit of snark, you know. Um, no. <laughs> um, you know, how, 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 can I, how can I take this knowledge that I've spent, you know, years studying and working in and transferring that to someone else. Um, but in reality, we should be flattered. Um, people are wanting to learn about this cool work that we are all involved in. Um, but once one person hears about that, um, it, it's, oh, maps? So what, we want, what I wanted to do is just uh, share with you some lessons learned and hopefully um, get some feedback throughout uh, the next couple of days um, of just ways that we can improve and, and you know, work together and share ideas. Daniel, I really appreciated uh, your talk. I, I got a lot out of that. Um, and we'll certainly uh, look to build from some of that as well. Um, so in the past few years, um, we, we've worked with a number of partner national societies um, across the world and including within our own um, American Red Cross uh, in, in training in GIS, mobile data collection, um, and, and information management practices. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of, of how we've worked with uh, training GIS with, with a few of these national societies. And so what, what's, what's really the, the major problem that we face? It's that people don't always know where they are. Um, and and we, we, we need to try and get them there. And that's not to say that people don't know where they are in the sense of I'm, I'm in this community and in this country, but it, it's a matter of the, their spatial thinking is different than how we've been brought up uh, learning it. Perhaps someone describes getting to a town that I would say is 20 minutes down the road, they would say, oh no, first you go to this town, and then you go to that town, and then you go to that town, and then you go to that town, and then you're there. Versus I would say, oh no, that's 25 kilometers down the road. Um, it should take you about 20 minutes. It's just a different way of thinking. But how, how do we work to train people to think a little bit more spatially in, in how they uh, interact with sort of the rest of the world and where, where do they fit in? Um, spa sort of a spatial awareness is, is different everywhere. Um, and my favorite way of doing that is, oops, you can't, you can't just do it by saying you're here because people think differently. This is my favorite way of doing it. Has anyone read this book? There's a great episode of Reading Rainbow about it. Um, I like to say it's my six-year-old daughter's favorite book, but I think that's just what I tell myself. Um, this book is a great example of how to, how to introduce people to the concept of scale. It, it shows people I'm in my room, which is in my house, which is on my street, which is in my town, which is in my state, which is in my country, which is in North America, which is uh, in the world, which is in the Milky Way. Um, it, it's, it's really cool. Um, and it puts it in, in words that a six-year-old can understand. Um, but, but some of the things that we learn along the way is to manage expectations. If you're working with a group of people uh, who've never really interacted with making maps before, um, you know, on coming into it, they say, you know, from this week-long training, we want to be able to manage disasters in real time, uh, getting real-time up updates and all these great, wonderful, fancy things. Um, but instead, let's say, how about we talk about the geoid, right? That gets people excited. Um, 
But if you're excited about it, you can get other people excited about it. And when you're managing these expectations, you can at least get people who maybe aren't as technical recognizing what they can ask for. Um, they don't have to know how to do it, but it, it's helpful getting them there um, and recognizing what they can ask for. Uh, make it personal. Use meaningful places uh, with local communities with which they can connect. Uh, a community that we worked with in Zimbabwe, um, we did this exercise of having them draw local, uh, uh, their local points of interest on, on, a, on a map, just a, a base map from OSM. Uh, and at the end of that week, some of them had said they'd never seen their community on a map before. Um, that's very eye-opening. We pull out our phone and we've got Google Maps, we've got Apple Maps. Um, we at the American Red Cross use OpenStreetMap as a way to help people build that sense of place uh, within uh, their community. Make it relevant. Use their own local data and every single issue that comes with it. If you bring a brand new, you know, perfectly clean spreadsheet, perfectly clean data set that has no relevance to the work that an organization is doing, they're not really going to be able to connect and get as much out of it. If you are, have a spreadsheet full of volunteers from different districts in a country um, that has merged cells and every single formatting thing that you can do with an Excel spreadsheet, um, work through that with them. Uh, show them how to troubleshoot uh, working with messy data because it's something that we all work, we all do and we've all learned to do. Um, and they'll be better off for it uh, because once they can troubleshoot, they, they've, they've recognized that they can start doing more things on their own. And you can also make it relevant by understanding the needs that they have. Oh, that's not the next slide. Um, rec recognizing the needs that they have. Um, so don't don't teach them to do a, a zonal statistics operation if that's what, not what they need. Maybe they just need to know a spatial join because that'll, that'll help them get their, their spreadsheet data uh, into their spatial data. Make it tough. Challenge the group and let them work together to solve the problems. Um, if we're just giving them clean information, they're not learning anything. Have them, by the, by the end of a, a week of training that I did in Zimbabwe, um, I, wasn't, I barely spoke on the last day because they are all just helping each other out, which is awesome. That's what I want because I, I don't want a million emails in my inbox after I leave saying, oh, how do we do this? How do we do this? No, people are helping each other out and that's really, really important. Uh, and, and building off of that, we just had two great presentations on you know, using Mapbox and using Cardo, uh, two very useful services that um, have made it very simple for people to put their data in and make a map. We need to do... The, when we're working with people who haven't uh, necessarily been making maps before, doing it in a responsible manner so that they understand the maps that they're making um, and, how, and what stories the, those maps can tell um, is very important. So make it useful. Um, as I said, the curriculum should reflect the, uh, and help set the, the basis for meeting the group's needs. Don't bring a web map to a PDF party. Um, in disaster response, uh, paper map still reigns. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful if you can have a, a flashy web map that you can click on and do lots of great things, um, but when the power goes out, what are you gonna do? Um, you still need that paper map, um, and a lot of times that's what a decision maker needs. They need a paper map in their hand that can help them make the decision uh, in, in a quick and efficient manner. And then the most important uh, part is make it last. You need to be sustainable. Um, map templates are critical before a disaster. Uh, get, getting things set up uh, so that the local community can really own what they're working with and, and feel proud of the products that they've made. And so one of the things that I wanted to share, cartographically, probably not the most beautiful maps, right? But these are maps uh, made from templates um, made by local community members uh, using their local data, uh, using their input, and using data that they actually collected. And that's the most important part. The map from Nepal was a, from a template that we helped make uh, for the Nepal Red Cross before the earthquake, and they ended up using it during the earthquake to help make decisions. And that's important. And so 
we'll get there cartographically with some of these groups, but in the meantime, their needs are met with a basic map. They can put their, line, their lines, their pipeline, their uh, latrines that they've built, their, their cook stoves, um, their volunteer locations, um, and, and their needs are met. And so all of this is sort of brought together uh, by fostering good data literacy, which is understanding and not being afraid of data, data readiness, making sure these organizations have the tools to use that data, and responsible data management, uh, showing that people know how to actually use that data responsibly. Um, so I know my time is up. Um, thank you. I'm happy to talk to people uh, the rest of the week. Thanks.